cast and walls Feeling high, feeling low I said bye Somebody waits for me Sugar sweet and so is she I said bye Bye Blackbird No one here can love and understand me Oh what hard luck stories They all had me Pack my bags and my up that light I'll be coming home late tonight, Blackbird, bye-bye. Gene Oates has spent a lifetime playing music. It's a passion that has ebbed and flowed over the years, but a passion that has always enriched his life. Music has always been a, a passion for me, uh, whether it be at home or at school, at work, uh, at church. Um, it's been something that has driven me. I like performing music too because it, it allows me to take my musical expressions and hopefully uplift or invoke some kind of a feeling with those who are listening, whether it's happiness, whether they want to dance, whether they want to cry. Uh, music to me is a, is a very unique gift that this world has that allows us all to express feelings through a medium such as notes and lyrics. Gene was born in Chicago and raised by musical parents. His mother sang in choral groups and his father played bass in combo groups. One of my first experiences where I actually got to, to perform was at my sister's piano recital. Donna was four years older than I, and I was about four years old, and we were at Miss Nichols' house, and she had each of the students come up to the front, play the piano, go back and sit with their families, and everybody clapped. At the very end, she looked at the audience and said, is there anybody else that would like to play the piano? So I just stood up, I didn't even ask my parents, marched down to the piano, sat down with all the pride in the world and just banged out the ugliest thing you've ever heard and everybody started laughing and I started crying. So after this great experience bombing on the piano, my mom intervened and, and asked me if I would like to take piano lessons and I believe I started a little young but I was probably around five and I took lessons for a little over a year, but unfortunately I had a lot of childhood things I wanted to do. So then the next touch base where I had with music was playing in a fifth grade elementary school band and I played clarinet. And so I played clarinet for about three years and I studied with a clarinet player who uh, was part of actually the Benny Goodman band at one point. At that point in my life, that meant nothing to me, uh, but he seemed to be a nice guy and I learned a lot from him. So both the piano lessons and, and playing clarinet were, were giving me a solid foundation of music and how to read music and, and the rhythm and how that's expressed in notation, which I found later in life to be priceless. When Gene reached his teens, he abandoned the piano and clarinet and jumped into the crazy rock and roll scene of the 60s. His instrument of choice, the bass. So my, my father had an electric bass, which was quite new, especially in our household, because he played a double bass his entire life. Uh, and then a bunch of seniors that my sister uh, hung around with at school was forming a band and they were looking for a bass player. So they actually asked me, who was now a freshman or a ninth grader, to play bass with them. And so I asked my dad if I could borrow his bass and his electric bass amp and he said sure. After a year of that, I, I decided you know, I'd really rather be out there with a guitar because it's a lot flashier and the girls like guitars better than bass players, I think. 
So I switched to guitar, uh, and then uh, we created a couple garage bands, at least that's what they called them back then. The first impressions of the Chaotix, and we did all the rock and roll songs of the uh, 60s, uh, you know, the Beatles, the Kinks, Jefferson Airplane, uh, you name it, we, we tried to play it. And we played a lot in, in high schools, but as we got a little bit older, uh, when we were seniors, we actually started playing a few clubs <laughs> illegally in some college parties. So we would, you know, drive 30, 40 miles and play for a fraternity party and, and such. And, you know, I, I gained a lot of experience because it, it wasn't just all fun and games. It was a lot of hard work. During high school, I also had a, a really nice opportunity. My dad taught lessons, music lessons at a music store, and he asked me if I wanted to go ahead and teach guitar there. I was all of not quite 15 at the time, uh, but I thought, sure, why not? It sounded like I'd make a lot of money. And, and so within weeks, I found myself teaching adults as well as kids younger than I was, uh, which really helped me to understand a, a lot more of what it was like or, or the importance of having relationships uh, in, in, with music because it's an important connection if you want to go anywhere. So there was a producer um, who was looking for band members to create a, a super band at the time and he found me and this is when I was playing bass. And so he asked me if I would join in with him, and he found other musicians around the state of Illinois and was going to create this supergroup. So we got together and we had several rehearsals, and, and yeah, you know, the music sounded good, but it sounded to me very canned and it was very much what the producer wanted. Uh, so that band, you know, broke up shortly, but it, it really helped me to understand a little more of the business side of what was going on in the 60s and 70s and still goes on. Even though Gene started out playing rock and roll and funk, he was always drawn to the blues. Inspiration came from artists such as Muddy Waters, Howl and Wolf, Coco Taylor and Albert King. So after uh, high school, I went to Chicago and went to the Rye Institute of Technology because I, I liked electronics. But while I was there, I met some other people that played music, uh, more specifically improvisational blues. Uh, and this was something I had never done, and they were looking for a bass player to, to join in with them. So I, I joined in and we named the band Window Face. Uh, and we literally would go in Somebody would start some kind of a theme, you know, like dum 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 And from there, we would just start jamming from anywhere from five minutes to 15, 20 minutes. And we actually got paid to do this by going to different places and playing for, you know, colleges in the area, but also some of the, the clubs in Chicago, and we would just jam. So we never really had any organized songs. We never covered any songs of the day. We just made it up and played. In 1971, marriage took Jean out of the city to Idaho. It didn't take long for the country influence to begin showing up in his playing. Living in Idaho was a, a new experience for me, uh, and especially in the music context. The rock was, was prevalent out there, but also uh, a, a like for what I would call country rock, 
uh, in the era where you had bands like Leonard Skinner or Doobie Brothers uh, were quite popular and the two bands that I was in, one of them called Mother Oats, uh, how the band got its name is a different story, and another one called Wiley. But both these bands became very popular uh, in that area and we were approached by someone who wanted to take us on the road also and to back up national bands uh, as the kind of starter band which again sounded like a great opportunity but being recently married and then uh, within a couple years uh, we had our first child presented a whole set of new challenges for me where my passion for music and the passion I should have for the family were in conflict and so at, at this time I had to make a really tough decision and decided to not play as much and I quit all the bands and focused on my family. For Gene, music was a passion, but he realized that juggling a high-tech career, raising a family, and playing music was more than he could handle. Something had to give. He chose family over music, and for the next 20 years, music took a back seat. He did play occasional gigs in Idaho and later in Seattle when he and his family moved there for his career. In 2000, Gene re-entered the music scene, starting a group called Quarter to Blue. Get out of my way, you small town clown. This country boy has come to town. Well, I stole a car and drove to Omaha, doing the best to stay away from the law. When the band caught me, got to hear what they done. They threw me in jail for having too much fun. Too much fun. That's news Quarter to Blue showcased Gene's unique blend of rock, jazz, blues, and country. But I ain't never had too much fun. Quarter to Blue was a lot of fun for me because it allowed myself as well as the other band members to take our life's experiences and put them into songs whether they're older songs or current songs and kind of make them our own for instance the song twist and shout by the beatles which we've all heard oops <laughs> take that song and, and turn it into more of a blues song. So maybe it'll go something like this. Another one of my favorites, though, that I like is Up on a Housetop, a traditional kids' Christmas song. But, you know, you can make that a little more of a funk song by a few changes. Up on a housetop, reindeer paws. Up jumps good old Santa Claus. Down through the chimney with lots of toys, all for the little ones' Christmas joys. Ho ho ho, who would know? Ho ho ho, 
jazz music has always been kind of in my soul and I wanted to, to play it, but I never had the opportunities, nor did I ever take the steps to do it. And it first came to my life when I was listening or watching black and white cartoons and listening to their soundtrack and they'd always have these little jazz bands playing. And I, I just loved it. So I decided maybe it's time to pursue jazz. So I was reading this local, um, whatever you call it, magazine. But it's, it's the Seattle Stranger, and half of it is really shady. But in the back, they had these musical classified ads. And I found one that said jazz or invitational jazz session. And what you had to do is call them and see if you qualified, and then you can go play jazz. So I thought, yeah, okay, and I called him up, and um, he said, yeah, sure, you know, come on out, and he gave me the date. Well, this jazz session was in a town called Hobart in the state of Washington, and Hobart is so big it has a post office, and that's it. So on a dark, rainy night, I'm driving out to this, this guy's house, and all of a sudden the directions take me off the main highway. I'm on a gravel road driving for it seemed a couple of miles was probably only half a mile until this gravel road opened up in, into his property. I got out of the car and he came out and he was very open, very friendly. I uh, walked in his home and he had a Hammond C3 organ with Leslie speakers. I mean, this is like top drawer, cool stuff. So as we're waiting for the other musicians to show up, um, he was talking to me about the jam session, and all of a sudden these guys came in who looked to me to be pretty old, carrying trumpets, trombones, saxophones, and there's maybe about nine people that came in and joined this jazz session. And so I thought, well, th this should be fun. It should be a simple matter of mapping what I know in music to what is going to be played. So the first song they selected is a song called Anthropology and I quickly thumbed through all my little fake books and I found a copy of it and it happened to be in the right key. And then when they started the song out it was one, two, one, two, three, four, but that that and I was not prepared for this. There was chords every two beats, half of them I didn't even know how to finger them correctly on a guitar. Anyway I bombed. In, and during the song, the, the, the best part about it is after they play these beautiful solos, they looked at me and they nodded, which means take it. So I'm going ding, 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 ding. And again, it was just terrible. And at the end of this <clears throat> several hours of embarrassment, um, I was talking to the homeowner who sponsored the, the jam. And he said, you know, we really want you to come back. And I thought, well, why would you want me to come back? I was terrible. He says, well, you know, yeah, you do need some refinement, but all the other guitar players we had would step on solos. They didn't know when to come in. They didn't know when to get out. They, you know, and you did a really good job of that, so we really like you to come back. Well, that was my first jazz experience, and from that point on, I decided I have a lot to learn. So after attending the Hobart Jam sessions a couple times and uh, learning about this much more out of this much I had to learn, uh, I was looking into Stranger ads again and there was this ad for a, a guitarist to play jazz funk in this band. Uh, so I called them up and they said, well, we're, we're auditioning, so if you would like to come in, you can audition. So I went down uh, and auditioned for this band and eventually they let me play with them. The interesting thing about the ad in The Stranger was it said the guitar player had to be able to read music. And I thought, hmm, well, I can read music. <laughs> I may not be able to play it, but I can read it. So Mavi was a, was a jazz funk group, and we played for several years around uh, the Seattle scene and did a few recordings. So even my experience with Mavi, though, it was a lot of fun and, and some great players were in that band. I still just, I needed to learn more about jazz, so I decided to take uh, our study with a professional jazz guitar player who had played for decades and um, 
really knew his stuff. And so I did that, and that actually opened up another door uh, because people that knew him asked him if he wouldn't mind playing with a group of singers, a cappella singers, but they wanted to have like a guitar player in the background uh, just uh, to give them some support. Well, that, it's the type of gig he didn't want, so he said, do you want to check it out? So I, I did. He sent my name to them, and I went in, which started my relationship uh, with Lexington Avenue, playing old standards like Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree, Chattanooga Choo Choo, uh, which was really cool and really fun because I loved their harmonies. <clears throat> And it was just me and them, and eventually they added a bass player, but that started me in understanding the construction of jazz uh, a lot more than anything I'd done up to that point. The monkey grabbed his neck and said, no, listen up, Jack. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and stay right. Straighten up and fly right. During the time I was playing with Lexington Avenue, I was really having a lot of fun, and I met some other people who actually were in big bands, you know, 17-piece dance bands. And so he invited me to one of their rehearsals to see if I might want to play with them. So I went over to the rehearsal and, uh, again, struggled through, uh, but really had a good time. And so they actually asked me if I wanted to fill the guitar chair in the band. So now I'm playing with Lexington and playing with this other big band, and there was a player in that band who played with a band called the Mach 1 Jazz Orchestra. And so that lead led me to a lead for a guitar seat in Mach 1 Jazz Orchestra, which I then joined. Uh, they accepted me in and just had the time of my life. Great musicians, wonderful time we played all over the state of Washington and Oregon and played on islands and hotels in Seattle, just, just had a great time. Well, then there was a player <clears throat> in that band who was in another band uh, that was also kind of associated with the first big band I was in, and it was called the East Side Jazz Orchestra. And this consisted of a lot of high school jazz teachers, a lot of very pronounced musicians <laughs> that really knew their music and stuff, and they played this extremely high-level big band jazz. Uh, so I tried out for them, hooked up, was in there. So at one point I was in three different bands playing. Uh, eventually I had to drop one of them out, but I played with Mach 1 and Eastside Modern Jazz Orchestra then for almost 14 years. Loved every minute, great people, great musicians, and I learned an awful lot. In 2018, a gradual hearing loss became acute. As the hearing loss became worse, Gene battled with depression. Music had played such a large role in his life, he was determined to fight back. At one of the rehearsals, um, well actually this was in a, what you call a pickup band where like a winery needs a, a little combo group to play background music. Somebody asked me if I wouldn't mind sitting in and playing with this, these other musicians. So I'd never played with them before and we had a rehearsal before the, the actual gig and I was standing next to the bass player with his bass amp at my feet and I couldn't hear it. And I asked if he could turn it up and he said, well, it's, it's already pretty loud. And I said, well, maybe if I, if I position myself here and then I was able to just barely hear it. Well, this was the first big warning sign that my hearing was going. And so over the next year and a half, maybe two years, I couldn't play anymore. I, I couldn't hear 
the music I couldn't hear, the piano I couldn't hear, anything. And eventually uh, my left ear was totally gone and my right ear went down to almost 40% of hearing ability. Uh, that was extremely depressing for me uh, in a time in my life that I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So after doing a lot of research uh, and talking to a few uh, ear, nose, throat doctors, uh, I decided to explore a cochlear implant. So if I may, that's the cochlear implant. And uh, using this to restore some hearing in my left ear. So I got that back uh, almost a year ago. Uh, and you have to reteach your brain how to hear sounds and what those sounds are and what words are and what words mean. I kind of uh, map that to a, a newborn who has to start learning language and sounds and mom and dad's voices and brothers and sisters. You know, they don't come instantly and in three or four months they're speaking and understanding everything you're saying. It takes time and that's the way it is with an implant. And so you eventually, when you first get it, it sounds like people are mechanical Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouses. Uh, it's very, very <laughs> discouraging but you just keep listening. I had to re-listen to scales because I couldn't hear some of the half tones. So I would, you know, as an example, someone would be playing a B and I think it was a C uh, because that's what it sounded like until I remapped that in my brain. Well, now I'm at the point uh, where I'm ready to get out and give this implant a good run for its money uh, and hopefully restore this passion and fun that I had in my life for several more years in playing with groups and teaching. Gene's musical journey has spanned over 60 years. Along the way, he has embraced rock, country, blues, and jazz, and played with rock bands, jazz quartets, a cappella groups, and big bands. Throughout the journey, he has sought new experiences and new challenges. The journey continues. Thank you. 